please help me in welcoming Nora Evershaw. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you again, Barbara. Thank you to the students in the Brown community uh, for having me. I think, um, as ever, Palestine and Palestinians remain in the news, but we're experiencing that reporting primarily through social media or some, you know, some other form of democratized media that pierces the mainstream occlusion of what actually happens to Palestinians who endure a form of structural violence year-round and uh, occasionally a mass onslaught as we see that has become quite systematic use of um, advanced weapons technologies to attack besieged populations in the Gaza Strip, a tiny, tiny coastal enclave that used to be um, historically uh, a massive port and one that many imperial powers fought over. Um, because of its riches, riches and its promises and has now been condemned to a form of social death. Um, unfortunately, lends itself too well to theorization and biopolitics, but which we have to remember is a site of two million Palestinians striving to live. Um, and, and this current onslaught of Palestinian worshipers who are attempting to connect with the divine in their own ways, con attempting to connect with a sense of hope to transcend the conditions that they live in, in the holiest month of the year, at the third holiest Muslim site in the world, which they should have direct access to, are instead made direct targets to be reminded exactly who they are, which in the eyes of Israel is absolutely Nothing, it's less than people with spirits because then you would have to respect that spirituality. And the world watches and has described all of this as clashes in a direct attempt to remove the dimension of power from this question and more so to continue to train us and desensitize us to accept that Palestinians will be Western civilization's sacrifice for the creation of Israel, an atonement of a uh, European Holocaust. And so we struggle against that desensitization. We struggle against a racialization of Palestinians as basically an excess population that we can completely do without. And so here we are re-examining these questions on race apartheid and settler colonialism, not merely to engage in, in a theoretical exercise, but in a, in a way to actually unsettle what is this training doing to us? How do we untrain um, and, and actually reveal uh, what Palestinians have been telling us? These are, these are um, in each of these, each of these, race, apartheid, settler colonialism, are distinct analytical frameworks. I've brought them together here to think about them together. Um, and this was brought up in Professor Alex Winder's class and his amazing students, many of whom I'm, I'm seeing here, um, who asked me, I think it was Rita who asked me, what happens when we use a framework like um, you know, apartheid or settler colonialism that reinscribes the centrality of the United States, right? In, and, and I'm not going to get into that, but in one way revealing for us, or at least illuminating for us, the problematic of trying to ascribe to any totalizing framework. So that is not my attempt here. That is not my attempt here. My attempt is to disrupt, much like the figure of Palestinians is disruptive. Disruptive to a global history, disruptive to the concept of post-colonialism, hmm? um, disruptive to the concept of um, hegemony. Um, in, their, in, in, in their refusal to surrender, in our refusal to surrender. Anyway, so um, in order to, to have this discussion, I don't know, I didn't do this. Did I do this? Okay, wonderful. I was not trying to disrupt this. <laughs> but in order to have this discussion, um, what I want to do is actually uh, use use the recent and abundant reports from mainstream and Israeli human rights organizations that have condemned or recognized Israel's discriminatory 
system as apartheid to use that as a provocation and an invitation to think about how could we think about the question of Palestine as an anti-racist struggle? Um, what does that look like and, and how can we do it? To have this discussion, well here, let me, let me start by telling you, for those who don't know, um, in 2021, Beit Salem, one of the largest Israeli human rights organizations, finally concluded that Israel oversees an apartheid regime, which it based um, on a juridical analysis of the 1973 apartheid convention that declared apartheid, which was a governmental system, um, as a crime against humanity. Mind you, it was later in the late 1990s that the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination concluded that this system was not particular to South Africa, but that it could be manifest in any, anywhere else in the world because it is a very clear system that seeks to, based on segregation and differentiation between two racial groups in order to ensure the racial supremacy of one of those groups. It enumerates some six categories of how we can identify apartheid in a particular region, though those elements are not exhaustive, they are suggestive. Uh, and so this is how we are to think about apartheid. And also for us, I want to signal for you already to unsettle that we are comparing Zionism to apartheid, but instead examining Zionism on its own terms. Now this was huge that Beit Salem would come to this conclusion because they had abided by a framework of peace and reconciliation as many mainstream organizations did. John Reynolds pointed out for us on Tuesday's panel that it was Human Rights Watch when Palestinian organizations ha were saying this very clearly, including the organization I worked for as a legal advocate, the Badil Resource Center for Refugee and Residency Rights. And I'm gonna share with you some of our legal analysis that we forwarded before the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. But when we were doing this work, it was Human Rights Watch that was condemning us as being problematic and, and short of suggesting that we were anti-Semitic, which has just concluded that, oh, a threshold crossed. Israel went too far. Now, let me just diverge from my talk a little bit and tell you, I honestly believe that these organizations have realized that this is the last moment that they can jump off the ship before they are condemned in a history of actually being complicit in supporting apartheid, right? Because they've known this. All of the research, actually, that they've built on is built by Palestinian intellectuals and advocacy organizations, though they do not feature centrally. Worse, none of the racial analysis that has been put forward by these intellectuals or these organizations was even mentioned since then. Or before then, Yesh Dean also concluded that it was apartheid. Since then, we've seen the Harvard Human Rights Clinic, Harvard Law School Human Rights Cl Clinic come to the same conclusion. We've also seen Amnesty International come to the same conclusion. In none of these reports is colonialism grappled with. In none of these reports is racial theory grappled with. In fact, the Bedil, excuse me, not the Bedil, the Beit Salem report is explicit to say this is not race. Whereas in South Africa, it was about race and color. In Israel and Palestine, it's about religion and nationality. So they basically conclude this is apartheid without race or racism. And there, this is not a mistake, but a desire to distance themselves from what I'm going to revisit in a drafting, you know, in, a, in some historical records, what remains incredibly controversial about coming to that conclusion. And, and uncomfortable for us possibly today, but I hope that we can also confront that. So what I want to show is, you know, use this as provocation, what was left out, why does it matter, okay? So to do that, I will begin with a juridical and empirical analysis of the Apartheid Convention. Okay, let's just get that out the way, all right? Everybody wants to know what's the legal analysis. Well, we've been telling you as Palestinian jurists, and intellectuals, organ advocacy organizations. So I'm going to share that with, so we can get that out the way. But I want to emphasize that this is not the primary point. Because what happens when we conclude this as a legal matter is we tend to, as all of these reports do, advocate for legislative reform. That somehow you can end apartheid through legislative reform. You just change the laws of the state. 
But if you don't address racism, what happens to racism? So think about you all are on occupied indigenous land built by enslaved Africans and African descendants where we are a white settler colony and between 1964 and 1965, the United States too legislatively reformed to end its racial discrimination. What happened to racism here? It's alive, it's very well, it's manifesting around us, it continues to organize us socially, politically, economically, and it is what I believe we are also, as part of our principled and ethical commitment um, to global freedom struggles must be committed to as well. Um, so let's get that out the way, and then afterwards I'll show you how Israel torpedoed its one pathway to enshrining and securing its Zionist settler sovereignty through the creation of a Palestinian state and how it torpedoed that possibility. Um, and then that brings us back to the Palestinian intellectual tradition and a racial analysis of Zionism. And I do that by going into the drafting history of Resolution 3379 in 1975, um, which actually came to this conclusion. It was an amendment to the Decade Against Racism that targeted apartheid in South Africa and Southwest Africa, now Namibia. Um, and here I go to the third committee, which is the committee that deliberated this question before it went to the General Assembly plenary um, in order to um, to, to basically trace what are the racial theories that were being developed and advanced? And what, what of them are still relevant? What have we not grappled with still? And then finally, the road back to a critique of Zionism, which we've seen since Oslo. We have gone back to a critique of Zionism. We are in this moment. I am part of that manifestation and that phenomenon of a direct critique of Zionism. Um, and then, you know, I'll end with some outstanding issues because we are, of course, never done. Okay, so on to the first part, the juridical and empirical analysis. Um, what Israel has made of Palestinians is to ensure that they are non-sovereigns of their own state, nor are they citizens of its state. They are basically going to be uh, subjected, subjugated uh, peoples in a single jurisdiction. I argue that apartheid is both the outcome of Zionist settler colonization that facilitates Palestinian removal and settler implantation, as well as the model legal regime to consolidate its territorial takings. This is the work that I did with Badin in 2012. We submitted this as part of a shadow report to the Committee for the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, demonstrating that Israel is in violation of Article 3 of that convention, which condemns segregation and apartheid. So what is the analysis that we present here? Now, many people have come to this conclusion, but not in a holistic fashion. They want to say that Israel is an imperfect democracy that needs to do better by its Palestinian citizens, but the West Bank in Gaza is where we see apartheid because of a dual legal regime, where here we demonstrate actually it's a single regime, and Palestinians are subject to a single uh, form of racial discrimination. And this legal regime is predicated on the bifurcation of Jewish nationality and Israeli citizenship. Those are not the same thing in Israeli law. Those are not the same thing. And in fact, being a national, a Jewish national, will afford you more rights than being merely an Israeli citizen. The law of return of 1950 defines a Jewish national as someone born of a Jewish mother or has become converted to Judaism and is not a member of any other religion. The law of return extraterritorialized Jewish nationality and uh, conferred exclusive rights to Jewish nationals to enter Israel to obtain citizenship and to settle anywhere within Israel's jurisdiction, including in West Bank settlements the and previously in settlements in Gaza. The legal framework of Jewish nationality effectively affords Jewish persons anywhere in the world more rights than the Palestinians whose presence preceded Israel's establishment, including those who were not exiled and have are now citizens of the state. Two years later, in 1952, the nationality law, better understood as the citizenship law because the law affords automatic citizenship to Jewish nationals while denying citizenship and residency rights to Palestinians who were driven out, 
and which repealed the Palestinian Citizenship Order of 1925, it resulted in the de facto denationalization of the entire Palestinian population. That's why Palestinians today remain the largest population of stateless people, some 12 million people. This rendered stateless the Palestinian refugees driven from their homes in the 1948 war, as well as those resident in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Gaza. Together, the law of return and the nationality law established a tiered order that distinguishes between Israel's Jewish population, which are, who are, nationals and citizens, and from its Christian and Muslim Palestinian population who are only citizens or citizens only. This distinction has facilitated the flow of privileges to residency, citizenship, land ownership, freedom of movement, and the right to leave and return to one's country exclusively to Jewish nationals across a singular geography throughout historic Palestine. So much of the Hesper that we see of Israel actually being a place of equality for the Palestinian citizens of Israel discounts, right? Just equates the idea of having citizenship as the same as having equality. And I think um, no other population should know better than us the fallacy of citizenship as being equal, unequivocal to equality as us. Um, uh, the Adala Legal Center for Arab Minority Rights in Israel maintains an ongoing database of laws currently totaling 65 laws that discriminate against Palestinians on the basis of national belonging. Israel's binary system enables the state to achieve its stated goal of maintaining a significant Jewish majority even in the face of nat natural population growth. In particular, the bifurcation facilitates a policy of forced population transfer. transfer. This is the most blatant, or I should say, the most blatant pillar of that policy is Israel's denial of Palestinian refugees, totaling some 5.7 million, the right to return to their homes and lands, which the state frames as an existential threat to the country, and other laws, which I'm happy to discuss, include the ban on family reunification from since 2003, which just became permanent, the Admissions Committee Law, 2011, the 2010 Amendment to the Negative Development Authority, and the Israel Administration Law of 2009, and so on, and so forth, and so on, and so forth, of laws that are embedded within, um, in the words of Shira Robinson, a liberal settler colony. Forced population transfer, together with other discriminatory policies, also predicated on the exclusive right to Jewish nationality, violate Articles 2C and Articles 2D of the Apartheid Convention. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. Instead, what I wanna tell you about is, you know, about the Apartheid Convention rather than go through the elements and the pillars. We've done this work. I don't wanna do it here, right? Um, that juridical analysis is, is easily demonstrated and now we have all these organizations that have done the same thing and before them, Richard Falk and Virginia Tilly did it to the UN Esqua and before that we saw it also established at the Russell Tribunal in South Africa. This is, there's a rich legacy here that we've built on. But what I want to tell you about the Apartheid Convention is two things. Number one, apartheid wasn't a crime because there was a convention. Apartheid became a crime because people organized themselves to declare it as such, right? So this way that we fetishize the law, is it illegal, is it right, is irrelevant because actually what matters is mass movements who determine these questions in practice rather than determining it according to some law that exists. Now this has to do a lot also with my own theory of law and its relationship to politics, which I'm happy to talk about, but this is absolutely the case here. Genocide also wasn't illegal. That became a convention, right? Human rights, um, the way we treat uh, uh, prisoners of war, all of those, right, are the product of some political movement that made them, you know, that legislated uh, what we would come to believe as criminal or legal. All right. The second point I want to make about the Apartheid Convention of 73 is a broader point about South Africa itself. Right? The way that we tend to see, or probably in our public imagination, is a very romanticized um, story of South Africa, that it was a site of white supremacy and discrimination that then gets toppled right, through, by Nelson Mandela, the ANC, and other revolutionary movements. Right? 
What gets dropped out the bottom of that story is that the apartheid was never a domestic racist issue. Okay, it was a colonial structure. It was a colonial structure. So because all countries discriminate, all countries discriminate, right? And racially discriminate. That doesn't, that's not the same thing when we try, what we're trying to do is to domesticate the question of race in order to actually remove it from the specter as a, 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 a threat to world peace, as Nazism was a threat to world peace, as white supremacy is articulated by the Civil Rights Congress in 1951 in their submission to the United Nation declaring the United States practice genocide against black people, declared white supremacy as a threat to world peace, and as Palestinians have declared Zionism as a threat to world peace. So South African apartheid was fundamentally a settler colonial project intent on removing black Africans, albeit it was an internal as opposed to an external displacement that characterizes Palestinian removal, expropriating their lands, concentrating them into small territories known as Bantustans, and supplanting their indigenous sovereignty with Afrikaner sovereignty. African apartheid was far more than the white supremacist project we remember it for, contained within these domestic borders. Its propo proponents understood it as a movement for Afrikaner self-determination against British oppression on a land without a people, meaning no recognized juridical people with the right to self-determination. The connection between Zionism and apartheid reflects in part their common origins within the crucible of British Empire. Richard P. Stevens highlights that the group of politicians responsible for the successful adoption of the Balfour Declaration designating Palestine as a site of Jewish settlement in 1917, namely Lord Balfour, Lord Milner, Joseph Chamberlain, General Jan Smuts, and Lord Selborne, were also central to the passage of the South African Act of Union in 1909. At the core of both initiatives, was the advancement of Western imperial interests in the African continent as well as the Middle East. Zionist leaders like Chaim Wiseman and Theodor Herzl understood this well as they appealed to Turkish, British, and German leaders for the right to settle in Palestine, arguing that settlement in Palestine would, quote, form a portion of a rampart of Europe against Asia, an outpost of civilization as opposed to barbarism, end quote. Zionists argue that Zionism is also a national project of Jewish self-determination. We can talk about this as well, but for now I'll quote from Abdin Jabara, who wrote in 1979, there is only one unconditional rule attached to the right of national liberation. No man or people may achieve national liberation at the expense of another people. Given this fact, any movement, including Zionism, which seeks to solve the national problem of one people at the expense of another, may not be properly called a movement of national liberation. While the international community very slowly and belatedly moved to isolate the South African regime, there was much opposition to this, namely, can you guess, by the United States, as well as France and the British within the Security Council who used that authority in order to actually stop um, more, uh, more forceful means to hold the South African regime to account which continues as an ongoing legacy um, in, in uh, protecting Israel. Um, while they were doing that, Israel sustained the apartheid economy through the development of a robust arms industry. The South African government regarded Israel as a fellow country under siege, quote, situated in a predominantly hostile world inhabited by dark people, end quote. In 1973, <clears throat> The UN General Assembly condemned the unholy alliance between Portuguese colonialism, South African racism, Zionism, and Israeli imperialism. Two years later, the UN would condemn Zionism as a form of racism and racial discrimination in Resolution 3379, placing it squarely within the agenda of the decade against racism, originally conceived to dismantle African apartheid. The international community achieved that mandate within the span of two decades on the African continent. At that very moment, when we see um, apartheid crumble, and we see Namibia um, declare its freedom, and we see Nelson Mandela uh, be democratically elected as the first black um, head of state of South Africa, was the very moment that the Palestinians are ensnared within the Oslo farcical peace process, which I turn to. This is the result of the Oslo peace process. 
The creation of a Palestinian state was one pathway to preserve Zionist settler sovereignty, right? Palestinians in entering Oslo recognized Israel um, and were ready to negotiate to establish a state just in the West Bank in Gaza, right? But that meant borders, that meant sovereignty, that meant freedom of trade, freedom of movement, possibly creating a standing army, jurisdiction over their own economy, over citizenship. This has been hackneyed, but none of that was ever promised in Oslo. Oslo was an autonomy arrangement, right? It was derivative sovereignty of jurisdiction on some lands over some people, right? It was an arrangement to create reservations and Bantustan. The same arrangement that um, uh, South Africa had offered in black homelands, but which was rejected not only by black South Africans, but by the international community as a perverse way to sustain white supremacy, and yet heal, here her heralded as a pathway to freedom. Okay, in the 28 years of Oslo, well now what? Well, my math is off. No, 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 it's about 29 years. We're about to hit uh, 30. We're about to hit 30 this September. <clears throat> in the 30 years of Oslo, Israel has torpedoed the prospects of a Palestinian state, which offered it its pathway to preserving its settler sovereignty. During that time, it increased its population from 200,000 settlers to nearly 700,000 settlers in the West Bank alone. Its settlement enterprise carves the West Bank into 20 non-contiguous territories. It has built an annexation wall that runs primarily through the West Bank and confiscates an other 13% of the territory. It oversees the de facto annexation of Area C. You see this blue landmass? All that blue landmass was a creation of the peace process, right? Checkpoints were a creation of the peace process. They didn't precede them. They were created by them. As was this idea of Area C, which would be you know, under Israeli civilian and military control and incrementally transferred to, to Palestinians, but has basically become the site of intense, ongoing uh, Jewish Zionist settlement, right? Israel declared this as de facto annexed, wanted to declare it as de jure annexed, but there was pushback uh, a few years ago, and now it remains de facto annexation. Only Ireland, only the Irish parliament, and also the result of tremendous advocacy has declared that de facto annexation is a crime. Um, and it's stated, uh, Israel has declared its sovereignty over East Jerusalem, as you know. Patrick Kingsley today referred to it in the New York Times as a sovereign capital of Israel. I mean, these are how um, these political um, crimes become reality. So what does the media have to do with it? It prohibits pal Palestinian travel and presence between the West Bank and Gaza, securitized the entire two million person population in Gaza, and continues the forced population transfer to undermine Palestinian national cohesion in order to maintain a Jewish national majority. Israel is manifesting to the world what Palestinians have long known. It wants the land without the people, and it wants to main, remain the sole source of authority from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean Sea. The Human Rights Watch report that concluded that Israel oversees an apartheid regime is more of an acknowledgement of the reality than a revelation of its existence. The report continues the rich line of resources as well as decades of Palestinian intellectual labor and ad advocacy. Even the title of the report, A Threshold Crossed, reflects that Israel has removed any plausible deniability of its intention to remain the sole sovereign and at best to offer Palestinians the opportunities to govern themselves in autonomous zones equivalent to North American re reservations and South African Bantustan, or homelands. The latter condemned, and here's the quote from 1976, condemned as an instrument to, quote, maintain white minority domination and to dispossess the African people of South Africa of their inalienable rights. At issue in 2021 is not whether Israel oversees an apartheid regime, but whether the international community is willing to acknowledge it and take responsibility for its dismantlement. The obstinate refusal to do so reflects a commitment to Zionist settler sovereignty as the optimal solution to combat anti-Jewish bigotry, as well as an often explicit expectation that Palestinian life is expendable and worth the cost of that endeavor. Okay, um, let me just show you a little bit about what you know the settler colonization looks like in each of these Palestinian geographies. Uh, these um, 
red-led masses are the Israeli settlements, Palestinians are in the built-up areas that are in yellow. Every built-up area in yellow within that red demarcation are marked for removal. This is where we see Sheikh Jarrah, right? This is where we're gonna see Hizma. This is where, where we see in Isawiya. All of these Palestinians, Silwan, all of these Palestinians are marked for removal. So the declaration of sovereignty over East Jerusalem was not the loss of a nascent Palestinian capital. It was the declaration that those Palestinians will be removed as a matter of sovereign right, okay? Here we see even in Gaza, the expansion of the buffer zone during Israel's repeated and systematic military onslaughts. So often Gaza is removed from the question of Palestine and certainly removed from the question of settler colonialism because there are no settlers there. And yet, um, and then I can get into the legal analysis of actually effective control, which is tantamount to occupation, but who really wants to get into that? <laughs> Um, suffice it to say that as the borders have been expanded for the sake of warfare, right, um, these have concentrated Palestinians further and enabled Israel to take more land. Um, here we see the same kind of machinations within Israel, right, within the imperfect democracy where Palestinians in the south, um, in the Naqab Desert, also known as the Negev, are being forcibly removed from their lands and their homes to be concentrated into urban township and to build Israeli settlements in their place. Okay, so let's now go back. Now we've established this. This is the juridical argumentation, okay, what you can show. Um, but under the liberal framework, Israel became an apartheid regime. Right, under the human rights approach, under the amnesty approach, under the B'Tselem approach. Israel was a Frankenstein. It wasn't supposed to be this way, right? Um, but this would be misreading the situation as it assumes the problem is one of governance rather than the one of ideology. Israel did not become a discriminatory regime. It is defined by such discrimination that it describes as national self-determination. Right, that discrimination, it describes as national self-determination. A return to the Palestinian intellectual tradition illuminates how Zionism is, is not analogous to apartheid and therefore you know, a Frankenstein that was reached or a threshold crossed, but how Zionism is its political and intellectual analog. Right, That from its beginning we, was understood as a discriminatory and racial regime. So I've periodized this intellectual tradition between 48 and 67, the first of understanding it as a form of racism. Then after 1967, this is when the critique that there is a dual legal system between civilians and martial law that emerges and, and takes place. After 1993, it's the Bantan Tustinization. Um, did I say that right? Bantan Tustinization. Um, of, of the territory, which you saw in the maps and visually for the geographers out here, and then from 2000, the year 2000 to the present, where we see in the collapse, right? We see in the collapse of the peace process. It collapsed in 2000 and then was carried on stilts, but it collapsed in the moment that the Camp David talks fell apart, right? It collapsed in the eruption of the Second Intifada, the Al-Aqsa Intifada, when Israel shifted from a regime of occupying Palestinians to declaring a war on the people it has a duty to protect. It collapsed when Yasser Arafat was besieged in the presidential compound and later killed, right? So since this collapse, we've seen a very reluctant you know, move away from the framework of peacemaking and to a confrontation of Zionism, which has meant scaling the fortress of Oslo. So to tell you the story, I want to go back to the history, the drafting history of 3379. It was introduced into the third committee at the 29th General Assembly. It's responsible for social, humanitarian, and cultural issues, and was continuing the decade for action to combat racism and racial discrimination, which I'll continue to describe as a decade against racism. African states initiated the decade against racism and the General Assembly endorsed it in 1972 for the sake of targeting apartheid South Africa. Participating states, however, expressed its goals more broadly as eliminating racism, apartheid specifically, racial discrimination, and the liberation of peoples under colonial domination and alien subjugation in 1974. In this context, 
In October 1975, Somalia, on behalf of a coalition of third world states, self-identified third world states, introduced an amendment to the Decade Against Racism to insert the word Zionism everywhere the words apartheid colonialism and racial discrimination appeared. Approximately two weeks later, Somalia withdrew the amendment, submitted now another one that basically recognized what had happened in the summer of 1975 when um, the International Conference of Women in Mexico City, where the um, Organization of Islamic States convened in Jeddah, where the Organization of African Unity convened in Kampala, and where the non-aligned movement convened in Lima, had all systematically declared Zionism as racism. And they wanted to acknowledge that history in the preambular text. Okay, what emerges? This becomes very, very controversial in the UN. We think it's controversial now, but it has always been controversial. I, what I want to do is do a reading of what are the racial theories that emerge from this controversial deliberation. There were three. Anti-imperialism, as I've identified it. Other scholars, I welcome you to tell me what I could have done different and better. OK, anti-imperialism, domestic discrimination, and supremacist ideology. Those are the three racial theories. Anti-imperialism was the most prevalent and widely accepted and reflected both the condemnation of colonialism as a racial structure as well as enduring Western dominance. The self-identified third world considered the denial of Arab-Palestinian sovereignty, like its denial of all colonized peoples, a racial matter. The League, of Nations, the League of Nations mandate system established after the First World War had predicated eligibility for sovereignty on the proximity to European models of government and society, right? So this is the idea that the denial of sovereignty is in and of itself white supremacist and racist because sovereignty was only afforded to Europeans, right? And even in the articulation of sovereignty as early as the 16th century, as shown by Anthony Enghi during Spanish conquest of the Americas, sovereignty is articulated in the direct opposition to non-Europeans. The Europeans are sovereign specifically because the indigenous are not. Okay. An observation of colonized people throughout the 1930s, including the League's role in sustaining it, black Anglophone revolutionary scholars theorized that colonialism reflected a dual structure of enslavement and international racial hierarchy. W.E.B. Du Bois explained that racial capitalist structures subjected colonized peoples to conditions of unfreedom for, quote, the benefit of the white people of the world. In 1960, in its capacity as an automatic majority at the UN, the non-aligned bloc successfully condemned colonialism as an illegitimate system of governance and established self-determination was tantamount to national independence. Again, that 1960 resolution, 1514, colonialism wasn't illegal because of the law. It was the people that made colonialism illegal. And there were arguments. There were heated arguments because many had argued that colonialism brought civilization. It brought plumbing. It reduced infant mortality rates, right? It was seen as a good. It took movement and struggle to condemn it as otherwise. The third world nations and nation states, the same ones that passed 1514, also considered Israel's establishment as an imperial imposition that effectively divided the African and Asian continents from one another. And this analysis crystallized further as Israel aligned itself with other imperial powers, specifically with South Africa. Bringing us to number two. Another widely accepted critique of Zionism as racism is, is, is that it's racial discrimination. This, by the way, remains the most widely accepted critique, that it, uh, it's tantamount to racial discrimination, right? This is the most widely accepted critique. This is what's embodied in these liberal uh, legal documents, a feature which I've mentioned. It's a, it's a feature of all societies which impedes inequality, that's contained with domestic borders, and it can be dismantled through jurid juridical strategies. Let's just pass the law. <clears throat> This, of course, of course, fails to consider the global dimension of racial regimes as well as the lasting power of supremacist ideologies that undergird discriminatory practices. Okay. <clears throat> I won't spend a lot of time here. <clears throat> I think this is self-evident. This is, let's go to the last slide. Supremacist ideology. This is the most controversial, this remains the most controversial, this is the one that's most difficult to grapple with. All right. 
You know what? <laughs> okay. Faiz Sayeh, the PLO Research Director and representative of the Kuwaiti delegation, who is the engine of the initiative to pass 3379, was careful to show that Zionist ideology, beyond its colonial practice, is by definition racist. The Zionist belief that Jews constitute a race and a singular people irrespective of religious piety or ethnic heterogeneity, Sayer explains, produces three corollaries, right? Racial self-segregation, racial exclusiveness, and racial supremacy. Sayer points to the writings of leading Zionists to illuminate how self-segregation within an exclusive Jewish state is an aversion to assimilation with non-Jewish societies. He then demonstrates how racial exclusivity, which he also referred to as racial purity, is the force that propels Palestinian removal and precludes cohabitation with them. Finally, Sayyid concludes, segregation and exclusivity make possible the manifestation of Jewish superiority. So this is the conclusion that Beit Salem gets to. Beit Salem acknowledges that Israel practices apartheid for the sake of Jewish superiority, but it will not trace it back to a racial logic. Um, but this is fundamentally rooted in a belief that um, Jews are God's chosen people, according to Sayyid. He and his peers were well aware of the concept of a Jewish race as the cornerstone of secular European anti-Semitism. Europe's racialized exclusion of Jews was predicated on the Orientalist conceptions of Jews as backwards, dirty, religious, and unfit for modernity. Jews are Orientalized and excluded on that basis uh, from citizenship, from integration, right? Um, this is how they're ghettoized. Um, it is precisely what led to Nazi insistence, among others, that Jews cannot be integrated into national society, thus rendering them ineligible for whiteness and exogenous by definition. As Edward Said would put it, the militant concept of a Jewish race derived itself not simply from the age-old persecution of the Jews in Christian Europe, but from the racial topologies of Gobineau, Stuart Chamberlain, and Renan. In a companion pamphlet to Faiz Sayer's 1965 intervention where he um, theorizes this plainly, Palestinian scholar Hassan Saab critiques Eastern European Zionists for seeking the revival of a Jewish nation rather than the defense of the rights of individual Jews. In response to anti-Semitism, he dismisses the Zionist concept of a Jewish race as a myth on par with the mythology of a German race conceived by Nazi ideology. Saab highlights how racial consciousness led both ideologies to believe in, quote, a special historic destiny. And although the deadly, he continues, although the deadly struggle between Zionism and Nazism should have made such similarities unthinkable, Anti-Semitism, Zionism, and Nazism were varying forms of racism and nationalism nurtured in a similar geography and in the same intellectual climate. Hence, and ironically, he highlights that both anti-Zionists and, I'm sorry, anti-Semites and Zionists believe that Jewish in integration is an impossibility and that Jews must have a state of their own. All right, so here we've come upon the flashpoint. This is what's so difficult, and this is what emerges in the third committee as so complicated, um, as well as the General Assembly. It's this uncomfortable and disturbing connection that made the claim that Zionism is racism so controversial. Even among the resolution's most fervent proponents, support for it reflected a belief that Zionism is a bedfellow of imperialism and or that Palestinians endured discrimination at the hands of Israel. But the flashpoint remained is Zionism a form of racism? Not is Israel racially discriminatory, right? Not are Palestinians inferiorized. Is Zionism as an ideology racist and a form of racism? The US ambassador to the United Nations, Patrick Moynihan, summed up this dissonance when he stated in the General Assembly plenary, quote, whatever else Zionism may be, it is not and cannot be a form of racism. Moynihan cites the Oxford English and Webster's Third New International Dictionary to define racism as a biological distinction that stratifies humanity and affords a particular group superior status with the right to do dominate others. Let me pause here and say, 
that this kind of biological definition of racism has long been abandoned and shown for being completely bankrupt because we've been able to demonstrate how close our DNA is to one another. So it's not biological, right? And we understand that race is a construction. But let's go back to 1975. Um, he then goes on to show that Zionism is, Zionism is strictly a political movement born in the late 19th century in the context of the upsurge of nationalism, which, which thus gives birth to the Jewish National Liberation Movement, whose members are defined by belief rather than by birth. Okay? They, they, they are Jewish because they believe in Judaism, not because they were born a particular phenotype. That's the argument, okay? He explains that Jews are self-defined self as anyone born of a Jewish mother, and this is the absolute crucial fact, he continues, anyone who converted to Judaism. And obviously you know, some of you may know actually, the impossibility of converting to Judaism, obviously for Palestinians, even those you know, clever ones who wanted to try as a way to return to their lands and homes. Right, this is not, this is, oop, this is not as easy as, as merely conversion as Moynihan suggests. Okay, but his emphasis on Jewish conversion is actually a reflection of a document I told you about a little earlier, which is the convention to end the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination. The convention itself, right, as I'll visit in, in hopefully before this disappears again, the convention itself is setting up some of this confusion. But Moynihan continues that Jewish identity is not a biological category because look, there's Middle Eastern Jews. There's black Jews. Israel is racially diverse, thus negating the idea of a singular Jewish race. Okay, Moynihan's reference is to this ICER definition. So let's go to the convention. This is the convention that condemns racial discrimination. Nowhere in the convention is racism defined or is race defined. The only thing that gets defined in the convention is racial discrimination and it's defined as such. It's the distinction, exclusion, restriction, or preference based on race, color, descent, or national or ethnic origin. Let me pause here and do this teacher thing. Do you see, if we juxtapose race to color, we should immediately recognize that race is not color, is not the same thing as color. But we go on to juxtapose it to descent, national, or ethnic origin. So now, racial discrimination can apply based on race, which is not color, or descent, or national, or ethnic, right? But can also be applied in a case of ethnicity, descent, and nationality. See, this is really making things difficult for us, um, but it's also what Fayez Sayer is using to make his point in 1975, okay? Um, this compounds the ambiguity of what is race and what is racism um, and it's reflected in, in the debates, right? The convention deliberately does not art enumerate any particular forms of racism with the singular exception of calling out apartheid, although it's impetus, and this is why this convention was drafted. This convention was drafted because of attacks on Jewish cemeteries and synagogues in Germany in 1960. The purpose of it was to condemn anti-Semitism as a form of racism. It was a fear of a rising neo-Nazism that the international community responded in the UN Subcommission for the Prevention and Discrimination of Minorities, which ultimately led to the proposal of this convention to create an international instrument to condemn racism. When the issue reached the third committee, however, the third committee members could not agree on defining anti-Semitism as a form of racism, and this has it's very political, there are arguments, do we also enumerate Nazism? How do we define this? Is, the, is some of the Arab states argued that if we recognize this, would that mean that we're condoning Zionism, yes or no? Ultimately, the resolution to this debate was to create two co conventions, one to eliminate racial discrimination and another to condemn religious persecution. And anti-Semitism is relegated to the document on religious persecution which in my opinion was a missed opportunity to understand it as a form of racism, right? Because Jews are racialized, have been racialized. What would that mean for our discussions today? How much richer possibly would it be for us to be able to engage in this discussion and parse out the continuing discomforts? 
Um, but this actually, the lack of a definition created a lot of confusion, sincere confusion within the 1975 UN deliberations. In his capacity as a representative of Kuwait, mind you, there is no PLO at the UN uh, you know, that can do this work. So Fayez Sayer is representing to Kuwait. More than that, the PLO is not, this is not a PLO initiative, right? The PLO wanted to unseat Israel from the UN. They couldn't. This was more of a consolation prize, and I can talk about that history. Um, but Sofia Sayer, on behalf of Kuwait, is repeatedly and tirelessly making the case against Zionism. He rejects Moynihan's definition of racism as a biological category by pointing to this definition, right? He explains that Zionist ideology is racist for insisting that Jews are not merely united by faith, but by membership in an ethnic community that had the right to create an exclusive state in the place of another people. He surmised, quote, if it could not be demonstrated that Zionism considered being a Jew a matter of race, it was impossible to speak of Zionism, excuse me, of racism. He then meets his own challenge by referencing the works of Theodor Herzl, the founder of political Zionism, or one of them anyway, to show that Zion the Zionist conception of Jewishness, quote, had nothing to do with religion. It was the racial link that made a Jew a Jew. As for diverse racial stocks, the Middle Eastern blacks, sorry, the Middle Eastern Jews and the black Jews within Israel, Sayer explained that racism is like a cancer that defies containment. And once Zionism had racialized non-Jews in Palestine, it soon came to draw a color line or a racial line among Jews themselves. And for folks who are more you know, familiar with the contemporary history, the explosion of a Black Lives Matter movement amongst you know, Ethiopian, Eritrean, um, and other uh, Jewish Israelis is an indication of this, right? So is the rich and tortured history of the exclusion of Middle Eastern Jews and what Ella Shahat would describe as a process of um, self-destruction. Uh, uh, self because for Arab Jews to become Israeli, they had to no longer be Arab. Okay. Significantly, Sayer emphasized that unlike anti-Semitism, political Zionism refers to juridical policy in, um, that's you know, embodied by an actual state. And so here, I'm gonna make a point for you that I think could be helpful as people have these discussions. Maybe you can think of this as a talking point, right? All states discriminate. All states discriminate. Racially discriminate. Israel is unique for defining itself based on that racially discriminatory basis. It is Israel because it discriminates, okay? It is Israel because it is for Jews only. Few other states, I can't think of any off the top of my head, will say that. Even the United States, because of this you know, legislative reform, no longer is conditioned citizenship on whiteness, right? This is the crucial difference, all right. In his appeal, Sayer persistently moved to a level of abstraction and asked the multilateral body to apply the law of the convention to the facts of the Zionist movement as well as to the Israeli state and just act logically by opposing racism in this instance as it has opposed racism elsewhere. But this, this, none of this worked. The Western states would not have it. They condemned, they condemned the entire attempt as anti-Semitism. The debates are very rich. But as a result, I think of the first two factors, right? The move, the third world revolt, which is rejecting imperialism as a form of racism, together with the alliance, Israel's alliance with the United States, which is neck deep in Vietnam, with apartheid South Africa, which it is helping develop nuclear energy, in its uh, alliance with Portugal, which is a continuing as a colonial power in Mozambique, Angola, and Cape Verde, um, is, right? is identifying itself as part of this imperial geography. So it's those, it's that, it's the fact that Israel had occupied the Syrian Golan Heights, the Egyptian um, Sinai Peninsula, as well as the West Bank in Gaza, that makes this, despite all of this controversy, that actually supports the successful passage of Resolution 3379, declaring Zionism as a form of racism and a form of racial discrimination in a vote of 72 to 35 with 32 abstentions. The Palestinian Liberation Organization would rescind 3379 
in 1991 as a precondition for entering into Oslo. So this brings me to the collapse of Oslo. Um, much of the anti-apartheid work since Oslo, including a significant contribution by Palestinians, has been defined as a legalistic tr uh, tr trajectory. So I showed you, I started by showing you Oslo and its, and, its, and its outcome and the torpedoing of the Palestinian state and the fact that it was never a promise of the peace process, right? What was promised is that we can have a great reservation with a lot of economic influx, perhaps an economic free trade zone, right? That's what Jared Kushner was trying to do and what several Arab states support. Um, but also set up a sovereignty trap, a permanent condition of proving eligibility for self-rule to a settler sovereign in the hopes of achieving independence, but rewarded only with limited privileges, ad hoc reprieves, and greater authority to police Palestinians for the sake of protecting Israelis. More significant, perhaps, is how the bilateral structure of the political negotiations framed as peacemaking ob obfuscated the very power dynamics that define the so-called conflict and cast Palestinian resistance. Right? It's this removal of power that makes this into a, you know, peace and justice. Every peace and conflict studies wants to study how do we, maybe if they eat together and play games and go to camps, we can make them, you know, we'll fix this. Which is why now as Palestinian worshipers are being attacked, newspapers describe it as clashes. They're equating a nuclear powered military with people trying to pray. This is the worst outcome of Oslo. It's the perversion of how we understand this question. The 1990s uh, neoliberal apex of US global hegemony in a supposed post-colonial era did not provide fertile ground for critiquing Zionism, right? There seemed to exist a chasm between the structural critique of Zionism and the fortress that Oslo built to insulate Israel. The road back to the gates of this fortress have been laid by meticulous analysis of laws, policies, jurisprudence, decrees, maps, municipal plans, water distribution and equities, urban planning documents, statistics of mortality and social death, as well as charting the rights that flow from distinct juridical statuses like nationality and citizenship as shown at the top of the presentation. I, have, I am guilty. I have been part of this legal scaffolding to get us back to Zionism. I too have been participating and wanting us to lay the groundwork to this critique by doing this meticulous legal analysis, this juridical analysis that actually did not take issue with Zionism but was taking issue with the law. Okay. Um, uh, let me say that, um, but here we are, here we are, we've come back. Emphasis on governance and that we can legislatively reform them creates the illusion that Israel's regime of discrimination can be re remedied through reform, inclusion, and formal equality, liberal solutions to answer the liberal critique. Palestinian critics, however, have insisted that they do not seek to simply democratize a settler colony, but they want to decolonize it through explicit disruption of Zionist claims and prerogatives. Legal analyses in the post-Oslo era have been by definition limited in how far they can go here. They have, how, have, however, carved an open space for newer generations of Palestinian thinkers and organic intellectuals to make a form of analytical um, return and renewal to the radical and unapologetic Palestinian liberation and anti-racist language of the 1960s and the 1970s, re-emphasizing Zionism as a settler colonial structure with a racial logic expressed through apartheid laws and institutions. These analyses have centered settler colonialism as a structure and indigenous resurgence as a site of study and a mode of resistance. So this is, I just wanna point out, uh, maybe I should have shown you earlier, how the scaffolding has happened between the two intifadas of the Al-Aqsa Intifada that you know, more or less ends in 2005 um, to the Unity Intifada last year at this time. I identify four phenomena that happen within this time frame. Um, the BDS movement, permanent war on Gaza. Each of these, by the way, is a lecture, if not a book, so I'm not going to do it, because I know I'm on time. Um, but BDS, permanent war on Gaza, black Palestinian transnational solidarity, as well as the Trump administration, for, for better or for worse, the equation of Trump to Netanyahu enabled an American population, at least an American progressive left, 
to understand Palestine as part of a progressive matrix. Okay, this is what Palestinians last summer declared in their unequivocal condemnation of Zionism, recognizing that the problem wasn't Israel, but that the problem was the, their, their Zionism and their separation from one another. Um, I'll just read the last line, which is to say that the goal, that that unity intifada, the goal of it, is to reunite Palestinian society in all of its different parts, reuniting our political will and our means of struggle to confront Zionism throughout Palestine. Long live a united Palestine. Long live the intifada of unity. Um, I'll actually end here. There were parts that I didn't get to, but I'm happy to take in the Q&A. Um, one is just on the outstanding question of race and racism, which I, I gestured to anyway in the discussion of how these other organizations are not dealing with it. We're really not dealing with it. The, some of the scholars that you may have heard on Tuesday are dealing with it. So this is something that's ongoing and it will also be resolved through political movement rather than through some legal um, declaration. Um, and then the other part that some of you may be interested in is, well, okay, what does the ICC have to do with this and how can, if the ICC, right, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, which is based on the 1998 Rome Statute and comes into power in 2002, articulates the, ground, the crimes, the main crimes um, in international criminal law, right? And one of the crimes of international criminal law is apartheid. So what is the potential of the ICC to prosecute this question? So I'll spare the however many minutes I would have had that discussion with you to tell you that it won't. It most likely won't. Right, but which then becomes a condemnation of itself and condemnation of the limits of criminal, international criminal law. So with that, thank you and I look forward to hearing your questions. Oh, I've left a whole six minutes for questions. <laughs> Can you hear me? While we're waiting for someone to take the microphone, maybe I, I ask a question, if that's okay. Please. Um, well, um, as you know, Ruba Sala was our previous mm -hmm. fellow. And I'm curious to know what you think about her push to think of Palestine outside of the national framework and how that fits in at all with your project. So she's arguing, you know, we need to think about Palestine beyond any kind of sort of national boundaries, given the fact that Palestinians are scattered around the world. Sort of Palestinians exist transnationally in the diaspora. They're refugees, they're, um, and so I'm asking that specifically thinking about Palestinians living in the Middle East and how the question of um, racism might sort of play out there. Um, and I'm also sort of uh, wondering how speaking about, you, I mean, you made it very clear that Zionism should, yeah, it's comparable to apartheid, but we need to look at Zionism in and of itself, right? So I'm wondering if there's some argument that can be made about race and racism as well. What does it mean to speak about um, race and racism from the US? I mean, is that, um, in any way sort of impacting mm -hmm. on the politics and the narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, Excellent. Um, so let me begin with the, with the you know, uh, what Ruba Saleh, Professor Ruba Saleh is doing is what a number of Palestinians have been moving towards, which is an increasing aversion to status solution, right? That the state has been framed as liberation when in fact, even when Palestinians entered um, into Oslo and agreed to enter into the Madrid peace process, right, in 1987, it was never that the state was the goal. It was also that the state was a particular pathway to freedom, right? Freedom was the goal. And absent the ability, at that time the PLO had been expelled from, you know, routed violently from um, Lebanon, and was now in uh, Tunis, where it could no longer even initiate cross-border clashes. 
or any kind of military confrontation, however meager, um, where we knew by that point that the two largest Arab armies, we knew by 1973 that the two largest Arab armies, uh, Egypt and Syria, were not going to wage a conventional war of liberation against Israel, where PLO miscalculation, one, denied its base of, of a robust, right? There, there's a version to calling it a Paris state or a state within the state, but at least we can say that there was a robust infrastructure of Palestinians constituted of the Palestinian refugee population in Lebanon that formed right, that formed uh, uh, self-governance, right, and an autonomy, a form of autonomy. Um, PLO was removed from that, in addition to the fact that it's miscalculation in the 1991 Gulf War when it allied itself with Saddam Hussein, as opposed to um, with Kuwait and the coalition of Arab states that were opposing Iraq's invasion of Kuwait basically um, weakened the PLO significantly and re resulted in a diversion of funds to now the PLO's primary, right? The PLO is a coalition of all these political parties, but outside of it was Hamas. And so much, and Hamas refused to enter into the PLO. It doesn't establish itself until 1987, and it's establishing itself in the crucible of the beginning of the Intifada and in rejection of the recognition of Israel. And now money is being diverted to Hamas. So all of these calculations lead the PLO to enter into Oslo in many, many ways to save itself. They gave up Palestine to save itself, right? So the state was never the goal. The state was never the goal. What has perversely, I think, happened as a result of three decades of Oslo is that the state became the goal, right? Can you have a Palestinian state? Okay, if we give you three kilometers, and an in, you know, infusion of money, can you have a state? If we give you a bridge that connects West Bank and Gaza, can we give you a state? Right, all of these things that were meant to make the state as accommodating as possible, as if that was the horizon. And the truth is, is that the Palestinian official leadership agreed. They too wanted the state. They are a political and economic elite. They are beneficiaries of a state, right? Even if Mahmoud Abbas cannot leave Palestine without Israeli permission, wherever he lands, he's landing on a private jet with a red carpet. So there is an investment in that. But the move away from the state is demonstrating, one, we already know that the two-state solution as, and I hate, actually, it's not the two-state solution, because Israel has always been a state, right? Israel has been recognized as a state since 1949. There's no confusion here. Palestinians have recognized them tw recognized it twice officially, in 1988 and again in 1993. The only thing that didn't, the solution that didn't exist was the Palestinian state, all right? So the shortage of the Palestinian state, of the recognition that it was not, it was a farce. It wasn't dead upon arrival. It never existed. It was never even suggested. The first Israeli head of state who would even articulate that there would be a Palestinian state was Ehud Barak in 2000 after seven years of doubling the number of settlements under a labor regime, not a Likud regime. Although Netanyahu does come into power and has something to do with it. Um, the first time he comes into power. Um, so it is this, you know, it's the, it's the, okay, fine, we've accepted the Palestinian state. It's, it's, it's not feasible. But even the one state solution, right, and the way that it's been articulated, and as I've been discussing and critiquing myself. But these things are iterative, right? They are a process of movement. Even the one state solution and it's, you know, almost appeal for equal citizenship, one person, one vote, right? Even that has revealed itself, as we've increasingly seen, as, as not our horizon, as not our horizon. Who controls those legal levers, right? Who controls the pace of legislative reform? Yo, we have a quote, excuse me. We have a quote here in US Supreme Court jurisprudence that I think best encapsulates it when we think about Brown versus Board of Education and then Brown versus Board of Education too. Brown versus Board of Education explicitly decries racism and the stigma associated with it. And then Brown versus Board of Education too, which was litigated in order to ensure that buses would take children to schools for integration said, articulated that, well, states should decide. 
at some deliberate speed. Who gets to decide how fast that process goes, right? It's this confrontation with the limits of these juridical answers, right? It's this, it's, it's this brushing up this like idea of civic equality, which isn't just that what Palestinians are brushing up against, by the way, right? I think that's what Black Uprising has demonstrated for us. It's the, we need something else. We want a different social contract, right? And so Palestinians both calling out the fallacy of the Palestinian state and the little heap of land they were gonna give us with a cute flag, um, and the, the limits of a civic equality, right, that have led us to this honestly uncharted territory, right? It's literally uncharted territory. For us to ask for decolonization is for us to ask basically for a radical imagination because the decolonization of the 1960s and 70s was far more clear. Colonize are out. Hmm? But we see in, the, in those post-colonial states that the colonizer out did not lead to justice as these own post-colonial um, indigenous regimes are cannibalizing their own people. We also see its limits in South Africa, which is now, I think, infamously known for its xenophobia against other Africans, right? And against an ongoing, um, what John also alluded to as a neo-apartheid in economic terms. So Palestinians, have been left behind an anti-colonial process, right? But also have the benefit of seeing what's happened across these landscapes. Now we have this task of, I think, one, if we answer this question for ourselves, we're answering it for a lot of other people as well, without having the predicate element of an independent state. What comes next? What is optimal to this? We're all studying this. Part of my own study of this is actually looking at how Palestinians are taking care of themselves. I said this in Alex, Professor Alex Linder's class. I'm gonna say it again. But part of that work is looking at those moments that I've also identified in my work, those moments when Palestinians were closest to our liberation was the moment when we took ourselves off the grid, when we turned away from the settler sovereign, from the desire for recognition, from the appeal of humanity to accept us as one of their own, right? and created actually our own forms of self-sustenance and care. And so that's a different project. That means that instead of going to the United Nations and telling a bunch of Western states why they won't include me, recognize me as a state, that means I turn to my population and we begin to organize ourselves. That means that the money that we have in the Palestinian National Authority does not spend 40% of our budget on Palestinian police that are protecting Israelis but actually spends that money on cultivating the land or accessing the water or creating schools for children who have been blocked off by the annexation wall. This is also not rocket science, right? Do we do it or not, right? It's kind of like the question about climate change. Nobody's confused that we're headed to climate doom. Nobody's confused about how we avert it. The only thing that's missing is political will. And the same is true here. Um, what was the second question? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the second event I've been to this week where you're um, facilitating, moderating. Um, I wanted to ask, um, what do you see as the strengths of the BDS movement, specifically its demands? Mm -hmm. And what do you see as sort of perceived weaknesses, areas that need to be shored, oh, yeah. shored up? Um, and then also um, relevant to what you're talking about with the first intifada, there's a film screening tonight at seven o'clock in Smitty B G18 um, that, uh, of Nyla and the Uprising, and Naida and Uprising, um, which gives like a sharp, I would say pretty sharp critique of the first intifada through like a feminist lens. So invite folks to come to that. Sammy, right? Yes. Thank you. Um, so uh, Sammy's asking a question that's actually you know, been really hot amongst Palestinians themselves. So boycott, divestment, and sanctions, um, I think is best encapsulated by the 2005 Palestinian call 
that encouraged international solidarity movements to boycott Israeli products, to divest from Israeli holdings, as well as to sanction the state militarily and otherwise, until and when it met three conditions of the end of the occupation of all Arab lands, equality, meaningful equality for the Palestinian citizens of the state, as well as the right of return for all Palestinian refugees. Now, BDS has done a tremendous job specifically because it created a way out of the sovereignty trap of articulating that our pathway to freedom had to be in some sort of status solution and help pivot us to a rights-based approach. And it also empowered an international solidarity community to transcend and overcome the intransigence of their governments, which had otherwise vested interests. And in so doing, I think that it's done a tremendous job. It's been mobilizing, it's been controversial for anything, at least, at the very least, because it's accused of being anti-Semitic. Somebody wants to ask us, well, do you think it's anti-Semitic? At which point that controversy creates an opportunity for us to intervene into a media cycle that otherwise tries to silence us, right? It's far, much, it's far better to be embroiled in controversy than to be shut out as a taboo. So BDS has many, 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 many um, you know, tremendous beneficial impacts. I support BDS. I was involved in divestment in 2001, you know, even before there was an articulation of 2005 when we at Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley, unfurled the banner across Seder Gate and, and said, divest from apartheid Israel. On February 6, 2001, when Ariel Sharon was elected a second time. Um, and so, I continue to support this movement. I'm very proud of the Middle East Studies Association for endorsing academic boycott. In the largest turnout of the association, 45% of members turned up, passing it by an 80% margin. It's unequivocal. I, I support this. This is right. Okay, but BDS also has its problematic, right? BDS takes up a tremendous amount of space, and unfortunately, because there's a political vac vacuum in the Palestinian movement, um, it becomes the source of the problem for why we don't have a political solution, right? But in my own interviews with Omar Berghouti, who is a leading member of the Boycott National Committee, right, that was not the purpose of, of the movement. They will not replace the PLO. The PLO has to be replaced by an organic, grassroots, democratic process, not by a group, you know, a large swath of Palestinians that have, you know, encouraged international solidarity how to support them. It's not even a Palestinian national movement. It's a solidarity movement, right? All we can do as Palestinians is ask people to believe us and to participate in it. But it's not a movement of, of self-realization, right? It's not a political movement. It has no political horizon. It's not built, it's not taking up political space. I do not think Right, and then the other problem with it is it because of its rights-based approach, it becomes really entrenched in a, in a legal language that's very liberal. Um, but notwithstanding all those faults, I think that the primary issue is that there's no um, political, that the political is absent, which then magnifies all of these problematiques of the BDS movement itself, right? I don't think it's upon... Um, the organizers of this, uh, of what is, they refer to as a human rights campaign, which I, you know, I think it's rightly regarded as a human rights campaign. And human rights, by definition, by the way, is apolitical. Right? That's the idea. You remove politics to achieve human rights. We can have that discussion. But, but the point is here is that I, I do think there's a lot of work to do, and, and Palestinians are trying to do it. Palestinians have been trying to do it. Um, it's, it's tremendously difficult. And as we saw when Palestinians organically did it last summer, across all of Palestinian geographies, including the diaspora, the PA, in order to assert its authority once again, right, this, this group, this amorphous group of Palestinians who, who came up with the Manifesto of Dignity and Hope, who came up with the Manifesto of Dignity and Hope, right, were able to mobilize internationally we're able to create this manifesto, not with any central organizing, not with a media campaign, not with any funding. That's power. We do have a latent Palestinian leadership. And the PA, in the direct aftermath, in June 2021, assassinated Nizar Banat and demonstrated that you may have moral and political authority, but we still have guns. So it's not for a lack of us trying, right? But our, um, our obstacles are formidable, yet not insurmountable.
know that there might be more questions, but unfortunately we have run out of time. Thank you so much, Noor. This was amazing. A big round of applause. <laughs>